Welcome to St. Giles Presbyterian Church. We are a caring community of faith in the heart of the Glebe. My name is Paul Wu. I'm a minister of the congregation, and I'll be leading worship this morning. We have a number of announcements I'd like to draw your attention to. Uh, actually, I have announced these uh, programs or these projects uh, last week. Uh, and so uh, there is a gathering tonight, uh, Talk Film, Talk Faith. Uh, it is in the bulletin. Uh, and I got an email this morning, uh, early this morning. I read that apparently that it's been oversubscribed. So if you haven't spoken to Stan, uh, it may be a bit late. I'm not sure, but if you're still interested, please approach Stan. Um, we, uh, there is a Tetsei service uh, for this Wednesday at seven o'clock. And uh, Tetsei community uh, began to gather uh, and to pray for peace uh, in the midst of World War II uh, in the parts of Southern France and continue on uh, as a, a worshiping community, a praying community, and their distinctive music uh, and the meditative singing and meditative chant um, has been embraced by a lot of uh, other denominations, community of faith across the world. And I think for us to gather, especially in a very troubling time, is indeed a good thing. And for this particular uh, Tetsu service, the focus is on healing. So songs and prayers of healing. And I do invite you, if you're able, uh, Wednesday evening, seven o'clock here in the sanctuary. Uh, for Friday, October 20th, uh, we have, uh, we're hosting a theater presentation by Tom Sherwood. Uh, so this is a project uh, that has a collaboration from a number of congregations from Knox, uh, from St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church, uh, St. James, Southminster. Uh, and, and so we are, uh, it, it is a, a one hour theater presentation uh, where Tom Sherwood uh, play both himself and King Solomon and in dialogue uh, on the book of Ecclesiastes. So if you ever feel that your life is meaningless, uh, this will be a perfect opportunity for you to, uh, to reflect and engage in, in this dialogue. Uh, so the presentation, and then there's a Q&A session at the end. Uh, but before that, um, the, the Women's Presbyterian Association of St. Giles is also putting together a feast. Well, snack and, and refreshment, uh, but we'll call it a feast nevertheless. So from six to seven o'clock is the snack and refreshment. And from seven o'clock onward uh, is the actual theater presentation. There is no registration fee, uh, but if you're coming, please let me know uh, so that I can let the woman association know how many people approximately are coming uh, so they can prepare uh, sufficient food. Uh, we wouldn't want people to go hungry. Uh, so that's this Friday from 6 uh, to, to 8.30. Uh, so please uh, come out. There is an additional announcement, and this is from uh, actually Tuesday, October 17th. Uh, and so there is a, um, a speech from uh, Ms. Chen Chu uh, from Taiwan. And so Ms. Chen Chu is uh, the current chairperson of the Human Rights Commission in Taiwan. Uh, she was a, uh, actually a victim and survivor uh, of the beautiful island incidents uh, where uh, back in the 70s, that was the trigger point for a renewed democratic movement uh, in Taiwan, uh, a, 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 an incident that broke out uh, that landed 
quite a number of people in jail, and she was one of them. Uh, jail for trying to fight for democracy in Taiwan. And, uh, and since then, she has held a number of different positions, including uh, mayor of, Thai, uh, of, of uh, Kaohsiung and for eight years and, and other official posts. And she's coming to Ottawa to, uh, I believe, the, the Ottawa Art Gallery uh, at 10.30 on Tuesday morning uh, to speak about uh, the topic is from authoritarianism to democracy, uh, freedom and human rights in Taiwan. So if this is something you're interested, uh, you can approach Vivian. Uh, she would have all the detail. Uh, I'm not sure if it might be too late to subscribe, but uh, ask her and, and she will point you in the right direction. I'd like to acknowledge the land on which we gather and worship is the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. The Algonquin people has been gathering here since time immemorial, and we are honored that we can gather and worship on this land. Please join me in the response of call to worship uh, that's printed in the bulletin. We gather in God's holy presence where God embraces us with grace. Here God will transform us into disciples. We glorify God who yearns for justice for the last and the least. Here God will write compassion on our hearts. We give thanks to God for God's persistent love that seeks us out. Here, God will breathe the word of life into our lives, so we will praise our God. Let us sing hymn 497, Word of God Across the Ages.
Good morning. I hear the Sunday school is planning a party, but where are the others? Where are the other kids? They're missing out on the party. I don't know if you have ever planned a party. I think perhaps, maybe, Annika, it would be your mother, or your grandmother, plan the party. But have you ever had a birthday party where your friends are invited? Yes. And did they come? Wonderful. They did. And I remember my own birthday parties. Um, here I am. I'm always talking about my sister, but. Um, my sister and I, our birthday are one day apart. Her birthday was July seventh. My birthday was July eighth. And Daisy would know this because uh, she she was my neighbor when we were in Taiwan. Um, my parents always planned birthday party at my sister's birthday, not never at mine. And it's always a joint party, never my own. And. I, I don't know, you know. I don't know why it still bothers me till this day. But I've always wanted my own birthday party. And when I was 14, my parents gave me that wish, a birthday party of my own, where I get to invite all my friends. Actually, they sent the invitation. I just told them, you know, who I want, and it was a wonderful party. They all came, and 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 we had lots of fun. Um, and that was also on, in that party. Uh, I professed uh, my love to one of my classmates and kissed her on the cheek. We won't tell Daisy, but so uh, it was a wonderful party. I, I always remember it. But it wasn't until later that I start to understand how much work there is to actually go into hosting a party. First, you have to plan it. You have to make sure that the, 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 the idea of the party is worthy. And then you have to figure out who you want to invite. And you got to send out the invitation. And then you have to wait for the RSVP for the reply. And on the day of the party, you cross your finger that people will show up. Because it's the worst for a host. It's the worst that could happen when you plan the party and nobody show. In your story, today, later on in your Sunday school, you'll learn about a story where God planned a party and nobody showed up. But you also learn about what ingenious way uh, that this host, uh, which actually referring to God, uh, uh, did about uh, this party that nobody showed. And it's a wonderful story, but I just want you to remember that in the party, in the final party, uh, that the host, uh, that heavenly banquet that we have, in that final party, you're invited, you're invited, all of you are invited, and we are all invited by God uh, to plan his, attend his one great big final party. And it will be a wonderful party. With that, I invite you uh, into prayer. Let's pray. Our gracious God, I give you thanks for inviting us into your family, into your kingdom, into your party. I pray that uh, we would always treasure this invitation and share this invitation with others who may not have come to know you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Have fun in your party. Join me again in this prayer of adoration, unison prayer of confession, and the Lord's Prayer.
Let us pray. O God of all time and space, you have called people to meet you over the centuries, in many different places, in many different ways. We praise you for welcoming us, receiving us as we are. You hear our prayers and calm us, claim us as your own. And in this hour of worship, send your spirit upon us to receive our faith and guide our footsteps in the ways of Jesus Christ, our, your son and our savior. Our prayer continues in this unison prayer of confession. God of all life and each life, you know all about us, our deepest concern and our fondest hope. We confess we are often anxious to see results. We lose patience when we cannot see progress. We blame others rather than seek solutions. Forgive us, help us claim your peace when our hearts are anxious. And our prayer con concludes with the prayer that the Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. While it is true that we have all sinned, it is a greater truth that we are forgiven through God's love in Jesus Christ. So be at peace with God, with each other, and with yourself. Amen. Our scripture reading today, first passage, as we continue to follow the story in Exodus in the lectionary reading, uh, passage of Exodus 32, verse 1 to 14. Uh, this is uh, the story of the golden calf. Uh, this is a story, I, I nickname it, when the cat is away, mouses come out to play. Uh, and the second reading, Philippians uh, chapter 4, verse 1. It's a short one verse passage. Uh, and this is from the, the message version of the Bible, where Paul encouraged us to stand firm in faith. And Vivian is going to uh, lead us in these readings. First reading, Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 to 14. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took these from them, formed them in a mold, and cast an image of a calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. He rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. The Lord said to Moses, go down at once. Your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshiped it and sacrificed to it and said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. 
Now let me alone so that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. Our responsive reading is Psalm 106. You can find it in your red hymn book, and we will sing refrain one. Praise the Lord. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Who can utter the mighty doings of the Lord or declare all God's praise? Blessed are those who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. Remember me, O oh Lord, when you show favor to your people. Help me when you deliver them. That I may see the prosperity of your chosen ones. That I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory in your heritage. Both we and our ancestors have sinned. We have committed iniquity, have done wickedly. They made a calf at Horeb and worshipped a cost image. They exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. They forget God, their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt wondrous works in the land of Ham, and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. Therefore God would have destroyed them, had not Moses, the Chosen One, stood in the breach before God to turn away the wrath that would destroy them. Great God, we Our second reading is Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. My dear, dear friends, I love you so much. I do want the very best for you. You make me feel such joy, fill me with such pride. Don't waver, stay on track, steady in God. This is the word of the God. Let us now sing hymn 174, Worship the Lord in the Beauty of Holiness.
before we pray, I have to say it because it's going to bother me if I don't. The plural of mouse is not mouses, it's mice. I made the mistake, I know that. Anyway. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Reading the scripture is an opportunity to be immersed in a world of others. The ancient Israel, the disciples of Jesus in the first century. It's also an occasion to join a deeper conversation with the people of God. Explicit or implicit, intertextual movement in the scripture connects us to a wider community of people, of words, of ideas. I think that's why I am drawn to passages that reach out to other passages in the Bible. It's like the Bible, it's alive, not just as a product of divine inspiration, but as a bridge across time, across space, where ancient authors and readers in subsequent generations engage collectively in the exercise of wrestling with God, with who God is and with who we are before the divine. Reading Psalm 106, we find the psalmist making a grand and formal appeal to God, written probably after the Babylonian exile. This psalm outlined Israel's unfaithfulness over generations, over hundreds of years and structure as a chiastic poem uh, where the beginning echoes uh, the end, the end echoes the beginning. Uh, this psalm echoes the captivity in Egypt to the captivity in Babylon. To tell the story about this long history of disobedience and sinfulness of the people. But more importantly, it also tells the truth about God's enduring mercy to the people of covenant. Psalm 106 is a communal confession, a national confession, as Charles Spurgeon tells it using often the communal plural of we and us. For example, in verse six, both we and our ancestors have sinned. We have committed inequity and have done wickedly. The psalmist leads the people, the nation of Israel in confessing their sins and appeal and, and appealing to God for undeserved mercy. But from time to time, we do hear the occasional I, as the person of the psalmist surfaces, however briefly, uh, an intimate moment in, in an otherwise public profession for example, in verse 4, remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your people. Help me when you deliver them. Now, Bible translators often try to paper over this occasional I by masking it uh, with the collective we. We find that in various versions of the English translation. And in my opinion, that's unfortunate because this occasional eye reminds us that the collective people of God 
is made up of singular, small, yet sacred individual, like you and I, standing before the Lord, reaching out to the divine, praying for mercy. Remember me. Help me. Jumping to verse 19 and, to, and 23, uh, the psalmist recounted the story of the golden calf uh, as recorded in Exodus 32. In that story, Moses was delayed in coming down from Mount Sinai, uh, so the people became impatient. They gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make for us, uh, make gods for us, and who shall go before us? This is a clear violation of the first commandment, you shall have no other god before me. Aaron, the brother of Moses, uh, should have shut down this rebellion before it even began a kind of nip it in the bud. But he played the politician in trying to manage the situation to appease the crowd. So he said to the people, hey, take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. Here I'm speculating. Aaron was probably thinking, there's no way that these greedy and selfish people will ever yield their gold so willingly. Or look, if they're going to ask me to pay a price in faith, I'm, they better be willing to pay an even deeper price steeper one in gold. Whatever he was thinking, the Israelites comply willingly and immediately. Back against the wall, Aaron had no choice but to cast the gold and form them in the mold to an image of a bull, a golden calf. The rebellious people, upon seeing this golden calf, Rejoice and proclaim, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. A clear violation of the second commandment, uh, you, shall have, you shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. When Aaron saw this, still trying to manage the situation that was increasingly getting out of hand, out of control, uh, he built an altar before the golden calf and made a proclamation, tomorrow, he said, shall be a festival to Yahweh, invoking the self-revealed name of the Lord, thus violating both the second and third commandment, you shall not bow down to them or serve them, and you shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God. Early the next morning, the people rose, offered burnt offerings, and brought sacrifices of well-beings. One can still see the futile attempt by Aaron to guide the wayward people back to God via a proper form of worship of sacrifices and burnt offerings. But the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose to revel, party. The scripture did not provide us with any description of that reveling, for the readers can probably fill in the gap using 
your own wild imagination uh, in the worst possible ways. Henrik Hein, the 19th century German poet, writer, and literary critic, uh, who was known for his satirical wit, uh, wrote this poem, Das Gottnet Calf, as a critique of what he saw uh, as the excess uh, of the uh, upper class in his generation. Now you can see this poem uh, printed in the corresponding cover illustration uh, on this week's bulletin cover. Uh, the text is not very legible. It's in German, so I'm not sure you can read it. Um, but uh, the poem, of course, uh, originally in German, but uh, allow me to read a translation, an uh, excerpt uh, portion. Double flutes, horns, violins, strike up the pagan dance, and Jacob's daughters dance around the golden calf. Broom, 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 drums beating, laughter, Peeling, with skirts lifted to the lion and clasping each other by hand, virgins of noble lineage reel like whirlwind around the cow, drums beating, laughter peeling. The English version doesn't do justice to poetic flair of the German original. Uh, you can actually hear the German original uh, via Google, you can do a search, and uh, it's quite musical, uh, at least sounds to my ear. But one could almost make out a, a rhythmic drum beating uh, in the background to this dance, this form of worship. It's a reminder to us modern and postmodern generations that idol worshiping may take different forms, but the allure, the attraction, the indulgence of it is still very much alive. It seduces us, takes us away from God, and leads us inevitably to our own demise, our own doom. That would have been the fate of the Israelites had it not been for the intervention of Moses. For the Lord God was exceedingly angry with the people. And the Lord said to Moses in Genesis, uh, in Exodus chapter 32, verse 9, that I have seen this people how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone so my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them. And of you, I will make a great nation. This is one of those what if moments in history. What if Moses was a bit more ambitious personally? What if Moses had entertained not just an illusion of, but a real, very real possibility of grandeur? How different would be the biblical stories of salvation and redemption? How different would we perceive God? However, keep the long story short, Moses interceded and God showed mercy to an undeserving people. Tragedy avoided, the covenant continued. Coming back to Psalm 106, the psalmist recall only the briefest summary of the golden calf story in a matter of fact tone, yet in verse 23, 
employing a theological uh, interpretation of his generation, the psalmist described uh, what Moses did that day as standing in the breach before God. The imagery of a breach is rich in meaning and interpretations and implications. A breach can be as simple as a gap in the wall, a barrier or defense, or it could also point to a gap in relationship, a broken marriage, injury done by one to another, a betrayal, or an unfulfilled promise. Therefore, to stand in the breach can be seen as plugging a leaky wall, or it could also mean to bridge the gap to bind two parties together, back together, to repair damage, to heal, and to reconcile. Moses certainly stood in the breach before God that day, and what he did cannot be minimized and certainly deserved to be memorialized. The gap between God and the people was bridged that day. Relationship repair, injury healed, and more importantly, what Moses did that day points to what Jesus was going to do two millenniums later on the cross. For Jesus stood in the widest, the most uncrossable breach of all, the chasm between the fallen humanity and the holy, righteous God. With no care for his own life, his own sacrifice, and in obedience to God the Father, Jesus stood in the breach so we would not be consumed by the holy flame. He still stands in the breach today, healing us, repairing damages we do to ourselves, to each other, into the world. When I read terrible news coming across the wire, be it conflict in Ukraine, tension in India, or violence in Israel and Palestine, when I see how our carefree society continue to worship the excessive consume, consumption all the while the planet burns. When I'm so tempted to give in to despair, I'm reminded of Jesus standing in the breach for us still. I'm reminded of Apostle Paul's invitation issue first to the church gathered in Philippi, but really for all of us which I read as an invitation to join Jesus in the breach in Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. And I'm reading this in the message version of the Bible. My dear, dear friend, I love you so much. I do want the very best for you to make me feel such joy fill me with such pride. Don't waver. Stay on track. Steady in God. Stand firm in the breach. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In this
following prayers of the people, I invite you to do so responsively. So when you hear the prompt, remember me, O Lord, please respond by saying, have mercy on me. Remember me, O Lord. Let us pray. O God of all who wander in the wilderness, you go before us as beacon and guide. You lead us through all danger. You sustain us through all desolation with the promise to bring us home to the land you have prepared for us. Remember me, O Lord, have mercy on me. O God of mercy and healing, you who hear the cries of those in need, receive these petitions of your people that all who are troubled may know peace, comfort, and courage. We pray for the people of Israel and Palestine who are mired in conflicts that seem to have no end. We pray for cessation of this current outbreak of war. We pray for civilians on both sides for their safety and security. We pray for leaders, not just in Israel and Palestine, but across the world to do the right thing, to uphold justice and mercy with wisdom and understanding, especially in this troubling time. Remember me, O Lord, have mercy on me. We pray for your church, Catholic and universal, imperfect, fallen, yet repentant. We pray for your spirit to continue the work to reform the church. Where there is hatred, let us solve love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Remember me, O Lord, have mercy on me. We thank you for Jesus and his teaching and the compassion he showed for his disciples when they were slow to learn. Give us patience and compassion when we are teaching something that we have learned and to make us good listeners so we learn from others' experience. Remember me, O Lord. And in this time of silence, hear us as we remember people and places uh, on our hearts this day. Remember me, O God, have mercy on me. O Holy One, hear our prayers and make us faithful stewards of the fragile bounty of this earth so that we may be entrusted with riches of heaven. This we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us now sing hymn 300, Father, we love you.
Let us now take this time to pass the peace of Christ, and we'll do so by first acknowledging those who are joining uh, our teleconference. Do I hear anyone from the teleconference? Okay. Uh, let me now acknowledge need to plug it in. We don't have a signal. Do we have a signal to the television? No? Okay. Uh, technology. You actually got to plug them in for them to work. <laughs> Who knew? Um, I see Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Good morning. Good morning. Peace of Christ be with everyone. Peace be with you. And uh, I see Jane. Good morning, Jane. Good morning. Hello to everyone. Peace be with you. Let me now acknowledge those who are here in person. Um, Katie, our vocalist, and uh, Heather, our music director. Thank you. And I see uh, Stan and Jean, good to see you both. I see Bill. Uh, I see Andrew, uh, Reverend Andrew Johnston. Good, to, good that you can, you can join us and uh, I'll see you later tonight. Um, Pauline, come as Wait, Trebian, Trebian. Um, I see uh, Polisena and Claude. Uh, it's been a while. I hope that you enjoy your time at Graceville. And uh, I see Megan. Good to see you. And I believe that's Max, our new friend who was here with us last week. Yeah. Um, our duty elder, uh, Chrissy and providing technical support at the corner, Stu uh, and Nick. Thank you. And Judy, good that you can join us. Our scripture reader today, Vivian and Alice. I see Dong, Kay, and I see Michelle, Jane, Good to see you both. And uh, Miriam, good to see you. Nelson, uh, and Bonaventure. Peace of the Lord be with each and every one of you. And also with you. And also with you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so most of the announcements have already been covered by uh, Reverend Wu, but you can reread them in the book St. Giles events. So Monday, October 16, 11 a.m., coffee hour by teleconference. Wednesday, October 18, at 7 p.m., Tay's service, sounds of, uh, and prayers of healing. Everyone is welcome. Uh, Thursday, October 19, 5.30 p.m., uh, there's choir practice. 
you're very welcome to join. On uh, Friday, October 20 at 10 a.m., Bible study by teleconference, and it's the book of Job. So, and feel free to come and have coffee and fellowship with one another. Thank you. As the offering are being collected and brought forward, we're reminded that the Apostle Paul urges us to think on things that uh, are honorable, just, uh, commendable, and true. To share what we have with others is honorable. And so our gifts can help create justice and work for truth uh, to prevail. So trust that your gift to God and know that they are pleasing to the Lord. Let us stand and sing the doxology. Generous God, we offer to you part of the abundance you share with us. Bless our gifts and work through them so that others will know your generosity and be touched by your love through the kindness that we offer. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let us sing hymn 477, Your Hand, O God, Has Guided.
Go now in peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you from this day and forevermore.